Hello everyone. In this short video, I want to talk about optical gyroscopes and uh, the principle that they work based on, which is called the Sagnac effect. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing uh, the name of uh, this person correctly. So, when I talk about gyroscope, this is the thing that comes to your mind, huh? These three different rings, and there is this rotor spinning at high RPM, and it is trying to maintain its orientation, right, due to conservation of angular momentum. So you have this gimbal and everything. So this is the mechanical gyroscope that uh, you see a lot, right, when you talk about gyroscopes. But in reality, if you look at Many of the devices that you use in daily life, from your cell phones to navigations and so on, many of them are not using these bulky mechanical gyroscopes like that. They are using basically the ones that are much, much smaller. If you look at StarNav INS systems or any IMU or anything that has gyroscopes, you see a small electronic devices like this or the other ones that are barely more than an inch or two okay in each direction probably in uh, two directions and in the height direction they are probably only a fraction of an inch right so they are small things and uh, you might wonder how could you squeeze all these gimbals and frames and uh, these uh, basically mechanical devices into that the fact is you don't the way that they work is different, okay? They are not working on this, uh, based on this mechanical thing. And one of them is optical or laser gyroscopes that they work with light. And in this video, I want to explain that. Now, there are other types of gyroscopes too, gas bearings. And there is another one which is based on the Coriolis force, okay? And this Coriolis force, I'll explain in one of my future videos because I really like to explain that because it's related to dynamics and robotics in general. But I want to explain in this one how this optical one is working and what is this, what we call Sagnag effect, the effect that is first time observed in 1913, more than a century ago by this person called Sagnag. So what is this? Here uh, you have a um, basically a, a ring, or it should not, not necessarily be a ring. It could be basically a closed loop, could be a square or anything. This is the path for the light to travel along. And what they do, they have a light source and they shine the light uh, to go inside this uh, circuit and come out and they do it by splitting it in half. So half of the light through these uh, mirrors and these uh, lenses, this through this mirror and those, uh, half of the light goes in this direction and the other half goes in this direction. They split the light and when it goes into this uh, closed circuit, the circuit is basically uh, through bolts is this this mechanical device uh, sorry this electronic device is attached to the object that you want to measure its angular velocity because as we know all gyros measure angular velocity omega they don't measure the angle that's one of the misconception you might hey gyroscopes give us angles no they give us angular velocity then we integrate them versus time to get what the angles and that's one of the reasons they have drifts okay i talked about this in uh, one of my previous videos but here the goal of this gyroscope is to measure angular velocity so this uh, optical device is attached to the object with bolts and it is spinning with the object at its angular velocity omega so what happens is one of these uh, beams of light when it enters this closed circle uh, it comes at velocity C, right? It comes at velocity C. So, of course, the velocity of the light is C. It goes in by C, but... Seems like I need to change one of these arrows. This arrow should also be this way, this green one. Yeah. So, both of them go in with velocity C, which is shown in green. So, they both go in with C, but 
with respect to a frame that itself has velocity what is the velocity of a point on the circumference of this frame that is v equal or omega right which is shown in blue so this point at the bottom moves to the right with v equal r omega that point on the top moves with v equal r omega to the left right okay so the relative velocity between the beam and the closed circle on the top is going to be v relative equals c plus r omega because c is to the right and v r omega equals to, is to the left so the difference is going to be the addition of the two because one is positive one is negative right at the bottom they are both pointing to the right so the relative velocity is c minus r omega so this is the relative velocity between the beam at the bottom and the uh, hoop and c, c plus r omega is for the one on the top okay now uh, because their relative velocities are different and they both go through one uh, circumference of the circle, which is equal to 2 pi over r, the time it takes the top one, the time it takes this uh, top one in, um, in red, and again, this should be this way. So because c is bigger than our omega and it should be both of them are to the right so this goes out right so it goes like this and then comes out this way this bottom one goes in like this and then come out this way okay so the time it takes for the uh, top beam to go through one round is 2 pi r over its relative speed uh, this one and the time for the bottom one is 2 pi over r divided by its own relative speed which is c minus r omega clearly the top one since it has bigger relative velocity it's going to go through the circle faster so the time of it is less than the other one so if you subtract this is the time difference between the two to go one round through the circle and get out now if you simplify this if you simplify this here, uh, you're going to get, if you multiply the denominators, you get c squared minus r omega squared. And then the difference between these two, which is 2r omega, is going to be multiplied by 2 pi r. So this guy is 2 pi r times, of course, c plus r omega minus what? c minus r omega. which is clearly 2r omega. And if you multiply, you get 4 pi r squared omega, which is this, divided by that. So this is the time difference between the two. Now, this device measures for us the phase shift between them. So it allows the two lights to come back. And when these two lights come back at the end and they get combined, and they have interference here with each other, then through the interference, we can measure the phase shift. Okay, so here what happens is interference at the exits and interference uh, can give us a pattern uh, proportional to the phase shift. So we can measure the phase shift and the phase shift, as you know, is equal to the angular the rate of change of angle which is in radians per second times what times the uh, time difference between the two which is in seconds so this guy is of course in radians now this one here is the frequency of course this is the frequency of that light but in radians per second, which you know, if you want to uh, relate it to the frequency in hertz, which is shown by f, that radians per second is 2 pi times f. And the frequency of a light way, a light beam is what? Based on what you know from physics, this f is c over lambda, where c is the speed of the light and lambda is the uh, wavelength right because you know this c is uh, meters per second and this guy is meters when you divide you get one per second which is hertz 
Okay, so here you see I replaced 2 pi over 2 pi f by 2 pi c over lambda. For delta t, I directly plug in the formula above. If you multiply, you get uh, 8 pi squared, r squared, c omega, and this lambda is multiplied by denominator. Now here, we do an approximation. We say this c squared is much, much bigger than r omega squared. Okay? Because the C is like 300 million meters per second. While this device, the R of this device is very, very small. Okay, how, can, how much can that be? An inch, less than an inch. So that might be this much in meters, one centimeter, something like that. And this omega, how fast can your object spin, okay? Even if you say your object spins at 10,000, uh, okay, 10,000 radians per second, still this number is 100. This number is 300 million. So this denominator can be simply approximated by c squared. And we can neglect this in comparison to c squared. Okay, this is a very good approximation. That's the case, then uh, what happens is, uh, let's make sure this C is not there, sorry. Uh, this C and this C squared would be simplified now that you only have C squared, and you get a C in the denominator. So as you can see, your delta phi is going to be approximated by this formula. 8 pi A omega over lambda C. What is A here? A is this pi squared. A is the section, the cross section, the area of this hoop. So you can replace that pi r squared by simply what? By A, this omega stays, that 8 pi stays, and that's in the numerator with that c squared in the denominator were simplified. So you finally get what? You finally get this beautiful formula that the phase shift delta phi is 8 pi a omega over lambda c so if you look at wikipedia from which we got these uh, these two pictures you can see this formula on wikipedia here i just tried to show you where that formula comes from and this is the basis for this device which you might call it a ring laser gyroscope it's an optical gyroscope, or uh, since this uh, Sagnang effect is there and there is interference, these optical devices also called Sagnang interferometers, okay? So you clearly see that the phase shift that you can measure is proportional to what is proportional to omega, because this entity here, all of this, 8 pi a lambda c that is a constant for a specific light of a beam light beam of light lambda is fixed c is fixed a is fixed for the mechanical for the optical device or for the loop so it's clearly proportional to what to your omega and if i know this constant k which is all of this guy here then if i know that k by measuring delta phi, I should be able to measure what? Omega. So omega is simply delta phi divided by that k. And this is what these devices are going to give us. Okay? So uh, hopefully you learned how an optical or a laser gyroscope is working. These small devices that don't have any rotating mechanical components like this, other than, of course, this closed circuit. This is how they are working, and in my next video, as I said, I'm going to talk about the Coriolis force gyroscopes, how those guys are working, because this is what you see mostly in real life, uh, as opposed to these uh, big gimbals. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.